All right, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to OUAB in the Kitchen. Tonight, we're going to have a pretty sweet demonstration. This week and next week, both are going to be pretty sweet demonstrations. But this week, we're working on muffins and a chocolate chip cookie. So in your kit, you've got two separate bags. Each of those bags have all the ingredients consolidated for each recipe. For this one, I have all the mise en place or ingredients that I need for the blueberry muffin. So for that muffin, I want to be able to melt down the butter. So I'm going to take that measure of butter that we have and put that into a saucepan and allow that to start melting. So rather than the wheat and watch that melt, I'm going to move over to where the cookies are and we're going to start on that production of a chocolate chip cookie. So we're going to use a KitchenAid mixer for our cookie dough this evening. However, it's not necessary. It certainly helps with the torque and being able to process it, but it's truly not necessary. So you've got a couple of sticks of butter, which sounds, sounds outrageous. And you know, in all honesty, two sticks of butter is a lot of butter, no matter how you look at it. But cookies, a lot like donuts, are an occasional thing, a now and then type item to consume. So I wouldn't see that that is a, an item we're gonna eat very often. So I'm gonna let the paddle attachment in the KitchenAid mixer move that along. Any type of stand mixture is going to do the job. I just say KitchenAid because it's right in front of me and it says KitchenAid on it. So I'm going to let that butter move around and cream out so it's nice and soft. One of the key takeaways from this methodology is to make sure that that butter is at room temperature. I strongly encourage you to leave it out at room temperature on your counter overnight at a minimum so that it's nice and soft, almost gushy when you go to put it into the mixing bowl or if in the whatever bowl you're going to work it with if you're going to work it by hand. Scraping when you're working with doughs and these baking type items is very important as are the measurements and so we talk about the principles of baking we talk about the accuracy of the ingredient measures and I think that's very important that we keep take mind of that so when we look at recipes for baking, we refer to those as formulas versus recipes that you would see for savory food because it's more of an accurate, more scientific-based result that you're going to get from those items being cooked. So now that I have this butter and a nice smooth, almost looks like soft, smooth, spreadable butter, I'm going to add in the two sugars that we have. We combined them all in one container to save some of the plastics to go into the earth. Although these are biodegradable, we love them, but anytime I can save some money on plastics, I'm gonna do it. So we have the brown sugar and the white sugar. Those can go in simultaneously into the mixing bowl and allow those to incorporate and to get to what is considered a nice creamy consistency is what we wanna do for that. While that's creaming, I'm going to sift together the flour, the baking soda, and the salt. So I have the measure of flour here and I'm just going to run it through a sifter. If you've got a more conventional sifter at home, feel free to use that one because it's probably more adequate. The ones that have the little, the little handles that stir and sift. Kosher salt is probably going to go right through your sifter and that's okay. And then the baking soda goes into the mixture at that point. Now we have what I would consider a sifted mixture of those dry ingredients. I'm going to move back to where the mixer is creaming the butter and the sugar together. This is just like any other cookie dough that you probably have made in the past. Again, I'm, mix, I'm mixing this by hand in a stainless steel bowl or a plastic bowl. Either way works out well. It just takes a little bit more time and more patience to be able to get all of those ingredients to work together. So now that I have made this nice creamy texture, you'll see this nice smooth, kind of looks like a peanut butter per se. At that point, I'm going to start adding in the vanilla and the eggs, each egg one by one, which I crack in advance just to be able to cut the chase in the demonstration process. Pick up the speed on the mixer just a little bit, or if you're working by hand, you're just gonna start kneading it like you would making a pasta dough or some other type of item that's gonna need dough. Making bread, maybe a lot of folks that you, maybe you had time to make bread during COVID, a lot of people tend to go toward that because they did not have much of an opportunity previously when they were quarantined. So a lot of people made a lot of bread and I think you're gonna experience that same working of the dough by hand in a bowl with cookies as you would with that bread. So I've put in one of the, one of the two eggs and I'm going to allow this to 
scrape down. I think that scrape down is really important if you're using a stand mixer with the paddle because things do not get incorporated well unless we work them. There's a little dimple at the bottom of the bowl on most all mixing bowls that we have that are on stand mixers. It's important that we get all the food product away from that dimple as we continue to process the ingredients. So now it's moving nice and smoothly. All the egg from the first one is incorporated going right behind it with the second egg. And then I'm gonna move in with the dry ingredient, which is all those, the flour, the soda, the salt. I've combined them all into one bowl. And at this point, I'm just gonna start spooning that flour, those dry ingredients into the mixture as the paddle is working. And if you're doing this by hand, feel free to just add that flour in intervals this is one of those types of doughs. You don't have to worry about it if you overwork it. You're gonna pull some of the natural gluten that's in the, that's in the strands of the flour, but I, think it's, I don't think it's gonna have a too tough of a negative effect on your cookie dough when it's finished. So you'll hear the sound of the torque of the machine, and that's because it's got the majority of the flour worked into it, and that's why it's making that kind of stressed out sound. So now that it's all come together, there really isn't a lot more than I need to do. So I'm gonna shut it off. You can see the bottom of the bowl so it doesn't require any more of the, of the mixing or scraping method. So I'm gonna take all of the dough off the paddle and just use the right size paddle. If you don't have, um, if you, if you don't have a, a good size spatula at home, anything will work, a spoon a butter knife, whatever you've got at the house to be able to make things work. You don't have to have all this equipment to be able to produce either of the two recipes we have this evening. Now you'll notice on your recipes, based on your oven, all ovens are a little bit different, so each one is gonna have a different means in which they're going to cook. In the instructional kitchen, we work with, with um, uh, we work with um, ovens that are designed to be working with uh, convection and a little bit of moisture going into those convections temperatures. And so the temperature I'm gonna cook these at in the instructional kitchen is 320. If I was at home, I'd go to 350 and work it out in that manner. So now that I have that dough prepared, I'm simply going to add the chocolate chips and allow the chocolate chips just to kind of incorporate by hand into that mixture. You could do it on the machine, but I think the machine had had enough torque you could hear it whining out as we were allowing it to mix. And I try to take care of these machines because they uh, are good and good to me if I take care of them. So now I have this nice dough. You can see that it's nice and heavy. It's almost pliable and it's just embellished with chocolate chips. Do you have to put all those chocolate chips in there? Oh, absolutely not. This just makes a very good structured cookie at the end. And it is one of those things that folks like to have the assurance that they have a chocolate chip in every bite. The next step is basically to just portion them out and each of those you can use a spoon to portion them out. I'm going to use this black scoop which this black scoop is going to identify that I'm going to get 30 scoops about the same size to equal a quart. So all these various scoops that they sell in cook stores you'll find have those numbers on them and that's what that represents is the number of scoops that would fill a one quart volume measure. So this dough will yield 21 cookies if you're using this size. If you want to make them a little bit smaller feel free. There's a lot less guilt involved in a smaller size cookie. Having them about two digits apart on all sides is going to give you the liberty to have them not kissing in the process of the baking and you won't have to cut through them to get them off the pan. So I'm going to be able to put 12 of the 21 on this tray based on the trays you have at home. This dough freeze is really nice. So feel free to take that dough, portion it out if you want, or just leave it in a log and come back to it another time because it does freeze really well. So I'm going to put this in a 320 oven at home. I'm going to put it in a 350 oven. And at that point, I'm going to let those cook until they have a nice golden brown edges and they're ready to go onto a cooling rack to finish from there. While that 
cookie dough is being made, we have butter that's been melted down. And so I didn't even have to use a flame because the flame on this stove top in the instructional kitchen is quite high for the pilot. So I'm all good to go there. First step on the muffins, I'm going to sift the dry ingredients, which are going to include the flour measure, just like we did with the cookies. And I'm going to sift the baking powder to go through there, the kosher salt. Sugar doesn't need to be sifted, but that's step one that I'm going to do for that process. Next item that I'm going to work on is going to be the wet items. And for that, I have two eggs, which I cracked in advance. So I'm going to put those into the mixing bowl and allow those to become homogenous just by whisking them just like you would prepare scrambled eggs. So I have the whisk and just moving them around. You could use a fork if you wanted to. If you don't have one of these whisks, it certainly is a nice tool to have at home because it has a lot of value. You can do a lot of things with it, especially if you don't have electric equipment to work with to be able to make these processes work. So right after I've got the eggs whipped and they look like they're ready to go into a skillet for scrambled, I'm going to put in the, the measure of vanilla. It's a nice vanilla extract. And then I'm going to put in some zested lemon. So the lemon, just going to use the exterior of the lemon you have in your kit. And just use the bright yellow exterior of the lemon, which is where all the dynamic flavors are that are retained with oil. So the oil is where the flavor comes from on that lemon zest. So the white part, you might be tempted to go all the way deep into that, but that white part is gonna be a little bit bitter, and I think just the bright yellow is gonna be in your best interest. So now you have this lovely lemon that you can squeeze into water for a health benefit, or you can absolutely make yourself a little bit of lemonade. So now that I have that vanilla lemon in the mixture, I'm going to go in with the milk, the milk measure. Sometimes it's good to allow that milk to warm up the room temperature before you start. It's really up to you. The melted butter, get it all into the mixture, which is why I like to allow the milk to warm up a little bit, just so that it doesn't seize up the butter and you have chunks of butter. That changes the game a little bit. After that, I'm gonna put in the the sugar and allow the sugar to somewhat dissolve in the mixture of the egg. And the last thing I'm going to do is put in the flour because once I put in the flour, I don't want to work the dough very much. I don't want to work the batter very much at all. I want to keep it nice and simple. So now I'm going to simply just put in the flour. I'll put it all in there in one shot. And I'm going to be very conscientious of how much activity I have in the bowl as I'm stirring that in. So I want this to be a batter, very similar to what we'd have for pancakes. It's going to be a little bit lumpy, not major league lumpy, but have some lumps in the mixture so that it has the ability to rise and not have it overworked. If you overwork this batter, you're going to find that the muffin is going to be tough and it's not going to have that nice tender consistency that we that we truly look for when we're having a muffin. The blueberries I left out. We're going to put those in a little bit later. A muffin plaque would be ideal to work with if you have one at home. If you do not have one, no worries. You can certainly use soup cup, coffee cups, anything like that you can use to work with to be able to make a muffin or a muffin-like or just mini cakes. Whatever you've got at home works. You don't have to have Everything that we have here in the instructional kitchen, I get it. We're still developing our kitchen inventory and you get what you got when you can get it. But little by little, I think every, every month or so, going to a restaurant supply warehouse or some type of a cook store that's affordable. I'm not sure Williams Sonoma is affordable. They got pretty good stuff, but is pricey. So pick the good stuff, stuff that you don't have to replace a few years from now. I think you're going to end up with good results. So we're going to yield probably about eight good muffins. I try not to fill them any more than half or two-thirds, just so that they don't rise up too much. So I've got seven muffin liners here and a plaque, and I'm going to be able to yield seven decent muffins out of this. Great for breakfast tomorrow morning. I say if you did it in a coffee cup, man, that would be great. I think that would be wonderful to have 
in a coffee cup because that would be an easy way to make them work. You just want to manage the way that you test them and bake them in the oven so that they're fully cooked in the center. Some ways that we do that a lot of times is a little pick, a little cocktail stick that you just put on the inside and it comes out nice and clear, nice and clean. It doesn't have any batter stuck to it. You're usually in a pretty good spot for having that worked out. Now I have the blueberries and you've got you've been provided quite a few blueberries. If you don't like blueberries, save them for something else. They freeze nicely. So I'm going to put blueberries in most of them. And I'm going to put them in at the top and I'm going to allow those to go just kind of poke them down a little bit because I want them to have some I want to be able to see them a little bit. If I put them in in with the batter, sometimes I find that they sink to the bottom. So I like to put them in afterwards. So this is going to go into the oven also at about 320 on this particular oven here in the instructional kitchen. So that is the process of getting those items made. Some of the principles that are applied to baking processes, I hope that you were able to pick up on. Now in the effort and the essence of time, I elected to make a batch of each of these items in advance just so that we could move along. The chocolate chip cookies went in the oven first and those were the first ones to come out. And so we allowed them to cook until they had this very nice golden, golden brown edge around the outside. They puff up just a little bit on the top and then when they come out of the oven and they cool, they relax down a little bit. So you have chocolate chip cookies that you could shingle out on, the, on a platter or on a tray. And even after they're cooked, they certainly freeze very nicely. Give them a little bit of time to thaw out. I remember one of the hotels that I worked at, we had a chocolate chip cookie amenity. And what we had was a, a cookie like this size. And what we did with that cookie is we, we put two of them together like this. So we, in the middle, we put a chocolate ganache, almost like a very rich chocolate frosting. And then we sandwiched the two cookies together like this. And then we let it kind of, that was an adhesive for that. And then we split them directly in half. Then those halves, we, we stood them up so that the two sandwiches were left on a flat surface. And then we dipped that flat surface in a melted chocolate and some nice crushed almonds. And we would line up two or three of those little cookies for an amenity. And I'm telling you what, folks love them, especially if they had brought their kids to the, to the hotel for whatever that was, a summer outing or a conference or whatever that might be. I always like the look of the stacked cookie just because I think it's out of the ordinary. And I, I always like the way it looks, kind of neat and kind of different. So the muffins come out of the oven, nice and brown on top. On this, the blueberries actually sunk down a little bit in the baking process, but it should pop up nice and pretty, have a nice golden brown on top fully cooked and you can see blueberries kind of hiding out in the bottom of the, of the muffin and there's nothing wrong with that. So that is our principles of baking presentation for this evening. We got a lovely, very nice, occasional to eat chocolate chip cookie and a beautiful blueberry muffin. Great for a snack later on in the afternoon to give you a little lift or a wonderful tomorrow morning for breakfast. Hopefully you enjoyed principles of baking with OUAB in the kitchen. Have a great evening.